welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. It's good to see everyone here for another lunch and learn uh, presentation. I'm Christopher Davidson, the state archivist and assistant vice chancellor with the University System of Georgia. The Georgia Archives is part of the university system, and so I will receive the archives, including the State Records Center, which is located in Austell. Uh, our monthly lunch and learn programs are sponsored by the Friends of Georgia Archives and History. Um, some of you who may have been here in the past kind of got uh, maybe expecting some refreshments. We don't have refreshments today. Uh, it's 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 it's, it's, it's uh, because Penny left, so she's at Clayton State next door. If you want to complain, feel free to go up there. So uh, Tracy, who you'll see come and go, and I are filling in until we can uh, uh, get Penny's uh, position filled. And then we can start to have refreshments again. Uh, I would have brought a cake. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to say thank you to FOGA. FOGA has a new brochure. Uh, this says it's on the back table. I don't think it's actually on the back. It may be on the back table. Something's back there. If not, we have some copies at the front desk. If you're interested in the, the work FOGA does, joining FOGA, uh, they, they would. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Again, Penny's not here. Uh, so yes, FOGA is the Friends of Georgia Archives and History. Um, they meet here. Uh, they raise money to assist us to do things we couldn't do otherwise. One of the projects that they raise money for is our intern. Um, Tracy, who I mentioned, is back in the room again. Tracy works in our preservation program, and, and part of that is uh, our in conservation intern uh, who works with Tracy, and that'll be We'll be announcing that soon. So, um, you know, anybody interested in, in, in the internship, be on the lookout for that. Uh, make sure we have your email. Um, I think when you register, when you come in, we get the e your email. We have a lot of information we send out about that. And always, you can check our website, georgiaarchives.org. After this presentation, if you want to go into the reference room to research or look around to see what we have and do not have a researcher's card, please go to the welcome desk down at the front and sign up. That card's good for five years and allow you to go in the back and, and do research. We're happy to welcome our speaker, Paul Crater, but before Paul starts, we'll first have a door prize. Uh, and so here's the door prize, Vanishing Georgia, and I'll have Paul draw one of these uh, tickets from my hand. I'll call out the number. 4811725. That would be me. I got it, but wait, wait. You have wait. one already? I bought a copy and then I want a copy, so I don't <laughs> want a third okay. copy, so I defer. Do we get it? We get All right, so we'll something. go for a second one. Four eight one one seven three one. All right. Do not have a copy, so I would actually take that. Vanishing <laughs> Georgia has a photo of Vanishing Georgia collection. Thank you for that. Paul Crater manages the Keenan Research Center. He is the author of three books on the history of Atlanta, including Baseball in Atlanta and World War II in Atlanta, and he is co-author of Lost Atlanta. He is the curator of Voices Across the Color Line, an award-winning exhibition of the Atlanta student movement that appeared at the Atlanta History Center in 2010. In 2014, he was awarded an Emmy for his contribution in the development of 37 Weeks, Sherman on the March, which aired on Georgia Public Broadcasting. He is a graduate of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Georgia State University. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Georgia Archives, for uh, inviting me to speak about uh, the Atlanta student movement. Uh, it's definitely a topic that deserves more attention uh, in our classrooms, uh, in our books, and certainly in our archives uh, and museum. Uh, my presentation will present the Atlanta student movement uh, in the context of an oral history project uh, developed by the Atlanta History Center many years ago, um, but one that continues to help the scholarship 
uh, on this topic. And as Chris mentioned, uh, the Atlanta History Center did produce an exhibition about the Atlanta student movement uh, on its 50th anniversary uh, in 2010. Uh, before uh, we begin, I do want to sneak in just a few words about my institution, uh, if that's okay, Atlanta History Center, specifically the Keenan Research Center. Uh, we are a leading uh, research facility for the study of history uh, and culture in Atlanta, uh, the state of Georgia, and the American South. Uh, the thematic um, areas on the left side of the screen illustrate uh, the broad subject matter on which we collect. Uh, the Research Center acquires and preserves material in a variety of formats for both scholarly researchers and the general public. The archives holds more than 20,000 linear feet of archival collections and library material, over 100,000 digitized uh, assets um, that you can view online, uh, 35,000 books, and over 55,000 uh, museum objects that include textiles, decorative arts, military artifacts and household items. We provide free uh, public access to archival and library collections and through our online databases. Uh, in fiscal year 2022, Research Center staff served more than 1,700 visiting patrons in addition to thousands of queries we receive via email uh, and telephone. The Keenan Research Center uh, conducts public programs, including genealogy programs and public lectures, uh, manages the institutional records of the Atlanta History Center, uh, and runs an oral history program and a community collaborations program uh, that uh, helps community partners preserve and promote their stories through various initiatives. Uh, we provide free, welcoming, and opening open access to our collections and we're open to the public by appointment Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And access to our collections could be viewed online at atlantahistorycenter.com. Just click the research tab uh, and there are our collection resources. Okay, so uh, on February 1st, 1960, four students at North Carolina AT, a t State University in Greensboro, North Carolina, entered a Woolworth store and then sat down at a segregated lunch counter to be served and changed the course of history when they refused to give up their seats. And although sit-ins had been a tactic used by, the, by civil rights activists for a decade, this simple act of nonviolent direct action launched a movement that helped end segregation and paved the way for civil rights legislation in 1964. Inspired by their actions, students at the Atlanta University Center Schools brought the sit-in movement to Atlanta and accomplished significant change in their own right. In Atlanta, the roots of segregation and racial discrimination and equality were buried deep. Many African Americans were not registered to vote. They often received poor education, lived in substandard housing, worked in menial jobs with inadequate access to health care, and suffered under the dual strains of Jim Crow and police brutality. Young African Americans hoped to change their situation, but did not agree with what they viewed as conciliatory tactics of their elders in the civil rights movement. They did not want to bargain for the rights and privileges that were legally theirs. Bonnie King, a Morehouse College student, took note of the actions in Greensboro, which had quickly caught fire Throughout the, throughout the South. King was a 23-year-old Navy veteran, an economics major, and a varsity football player. He led efforts to convene students from all six of the Atlanta University's colleges and universities, which were Atlanta University, Clark College, Morehouse College, Morris Brown College, Spelman College, and the four seminaries at the Interdenominational Theological Seminary, Gammon Theological Seminary, Morehouse School of Religion, Phillips School of Theology, and Turner Theological Seminary. The students formed the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights to press their demands and then later joined forces with other sit-in leaders to form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. The Committee on Appeal for Human Rights acted as a policy-making body and organized and participated in demonstrations. Spellman senior Herschel Sullivan later joined King as co-chair. And although many other students from Atlanta area colleges and universities participated, 
the leaders of that movement were students at those HBCUs. The oral history recordings and the 2010 exhibition at the Atlanta History Center will tell the story of a group of Atlanta students who quickened the pace of the civil rights movement, altered the course of history, and extended the legacy of struggle and determination for freedom of African Americans. Before we go too deeply into the collection and what the participants said about their experiences of the movement, it is important to talk about the impediments to full citizenship that white people from the South and their political leaders put in front of black citizens almost immediately after Reconstruction, which wiped out hard fought gains in political freedom won by African Americans after the Civil War. In this period of retrenchment over the next four decades after Reconstruction, black citizens were deprived of the right to vote, beginning with the institution of the poll tax in 1877 by the Georgia legislature. By 1900, only one out of 10 eligible black persons remained on the voter rolls. That same year, the state Democratic Party instituted the white primary, which barred black voters from participation in Democratic primaries. And because the Republican Party was not yet a viable party in the South, black political power was severely diluted. In 1908, the state instituted literacy tests, property qualifications, and the grandfather clause, which exempted white people from two of those restrictions if they were descended from a veteran, which did not, a Confederate veteran, which did not apply to very many black people. During this period, white legislators at the state and local level passed laws that created an enduring system of racial segregation. Known broadly as Jim Crow, this system reinforced the second class status of citizenship for the black community. African Americans suffered continuous indignities by the way they were depicted in publications, popular songs, jokes, and cartoons. And finally, the Georgia legislature instituted the county unit system in 1917, where statewide and congressional contests were determined through arcane mathematical rules that gave disproportionate power to rural, sparsely populated counties. In this system, the winner could lose the popular vote and still win by virtue of its county votes. In 1940, J Georgia's segregated system hardened into a rigid caste structure accepted by virtually all whites and even some blacks as the ordained and proper way of doing things. Despite these impediments, there were very real efforts on the part of black Atlantans to fight back. For example, in 1940, Dr. Benjamin Mays came to Atlanta as president of Morehouse College. Dr. Mays became one of the towering figures in American life. An ordained minister and accomplished scholar in the field of religion and philosophy, Mays served as president of Morehouse College from 1940 to 1967. Mays was known as the schoolmaster of the civil rights movement because he helped to mold the minds and character of his students, who included Martin Luther King Jr. and Julian Bond. Also that year, blacks in Atlanta voted to reject a citywide school bond because of the paltry amount allocated towards black schools. In 1942, while black troops were fighting abroad, the black press launches the Double V campaign calling for victory over the Axis powers in World War II and the defeat of racial prejudice in America. The Atlanta Daily World is a vocal participant in that campaign. In 1945, Georgia abolishes its poll tax. The state lowers the voting age of the age of voting from 21 to 18 and its white primary is ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge. All three of these developments led to heightened activity among Atlanta's black leadership and in the general population to fight for greater political power in 1946 and beyond. In 1946, African-American leaders stepped up their voter registration campaign for the midterm election of Georgia's vacated fifth district congressional seat and increased the number of registered black voters from 7,000 to 21,000. That campaign was led by the NAACP's All Citizens Registration Committee, led by Atlanta University history professor, Dr. Clarence Baco, which you see on the far left. In response to increased voter registration, a white candidate, Helen Douglas Mankin, courts the black vote, which provides the margin of her victory. In the wake of their political vi victory, black leaders press Atlanta Mayor William Hartsfield for civic improvements, citing a lack of African-American police officers 
Black leaders forced Hartsfield's hand to approve the recruitment and hiring of eight African-American men to become the city's first black police officers. In 1949, the Atlanta Negro Voters League is established as a nonpartisan organization by attorney Austin T. Walden, who, had the, uh, who headed the Atlanta branch of the NAACP, and civic leader John Wesley Dobbs. Walden was a Democrat and Dobbs was a Republican. The group sought to leverage black political power by unifying the black vote in local elections. To achieve those ends, the league invited candidates to speaker forums and issued candidate endorsements. Over the course of the league's existence from 1949 to 1965, this source of political power secured victory for their candidate in every mayoral election. In the 1949 mayoral race, the black vote solidly supported the incumbent Atlanta Mayor William Hartsfield. That election marked the beginning of an alliance between African Americans and moderate whites that would elect candidates to City Hall, whose political views were less racist than their predecessors. Having established their political clout in local elections, Black Atlantans were in a more favorable position to force Hartsfield to deliver on promises to build recreational facilities and enhance, enhance public services in African American neighborhoods. In 1953, Atlanta University President Rufus Clement is elected as the first African American to serve on the Atlanta Board of Education. And in 1957, a group of 100 ministers formed the Law, Love, and Liberation Movement. Six of the members sit in the whites only section of a city bus and are arrested. NAACP President Samuel, Samuel Williams files a desegregation lawsuit on the group's behalf, and Atlanta's public transportation system is desegregated two years later. But despite these areas of progress, the civil rights movement in Atlanta during the previous two years before the Atlanta student movement could best be described as a period of gradual improvements and negotiation. Their accomplishments, while significant, did little to quell the unrest that lay beneath the surface in the city's black community, where conditions in housing, education, and health care remain substandard. Genuine black influence in the city's political and social environment was remained, remained relatively weak as segregation remained the rule of the day. And for the young, less patient student generation of the 1960s, the era of incrementalism had come to an end. So with that very basic uh, description of what was occurring in the years prior to the 1960s. I want to talk about the oral history project that Atlanta History Center did to document the Atlanta student movement. The curator of this project was Dr. Carol Merritt. Uh, Dr. Merritt is the former director of the Herndon Home Museum in Atlanta, uh, and she is the author of two books, The Herndons, An Atlanta Family, and Homecoming, African American Family History in Georgia. Dr. Merritt did all, this, all the work uh, in researching the background leading up to the Atlanta student movement, the scholarly work. She developed the list of people to be interviewed. She tracked them all down. She did all the logistics. She developed all the questions, performed all the interviews, and created all the recordings and transcribed all the interviews. And so the AHC remains deeply appreciative of Dr. Merritt's work, and I am deeply indebted uh, to her in developing this presentation. I just wish I could have found a clearer picture of her. Uh, but I could not. Um, so as I talk about this project, uh, I wanted to show you snapshots of all the participants and giving a very brief explanation about who they are. The oral history project began in 2005, and the idea was to gather interviews not just about the Atlanta student movement, but the broader civil rights movement. There were 31 people interviewed for this project and 36 interviews recorded in all because some participants were interviewed more than once. The list included veterans of the Atlanta student movement, including Morehouse College uh, and Clark College, as well as other civil rights veterans such as C.T. Vivian. Vivian was, of course, an aide to Dr. Martin Luther King and part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, as was Willie Bolden, who was also interviewed. Faye Bellamy Powell, who was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, was interviewed, as was Willie Ricks, uh, who was a member, also a member of that organization. The interviews took place between August of 2005 and May of 2006. Uh, and the premise 
uh, I should mention too that Willie Ricks had or later changed his name to Mikasa Dada. Uh, the premise of gathering uh, these accounts were based on our assessment uh, that no social struggle struggle had had a greater impact on 20th century America than the civil rights movement. Nonviolent direct action and voter registration on the part of African Americans in the 1950s and 1960s succeeded in removing some of the more blatant forms of racial segregation. And that movement inspired significant social protests against racism, poverty, war, and gender inequality in the coming decades. And Atlanta played a unique role in the movement. It served as headquarters of two major civil rights organizations and was the nerve center of national and regional campaigns for racial justice. Moreover, Atlanta's relative calm in the face of racial desegregation set it apart from some of the violent resistance of other cities in the Deep South. Widely known as a city too busy to hate, Atlanta nevertheless conducted a protracted struggle against substantive change and today, like most of the nation, remains deeply divided by race. The title of, of the project was Voices Across the Color Line, Atlanta Stories from the Civil Rights Era, and the title referenced a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois in his 1903 book, the, Se the Souls of Black Folk, in which he wrote that, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter, race, lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands in the sea. The goal of the oral history project was to address Atlanta's unique place within the broad patterns of our nation's civil rights history. Through an exhibition and programs that followed, the project would narrate and interpret the events that shaped racial confrontation and change in Atlanta. And instead of focusing on leaders, voices across the color line sought to tell the story of ordinary people organizing for social protest and social change in collaboration with leaders. Some of the first questions for the curator in this, in this, of this collection was, who were the ordinary people? How did they come together and how did they experience the movement? In what ways did they shape the movement and how were they shaped by it? Many prospective interviewees on Dr. Merritt's list were, after more than 40 years, still reluctant to talk about their experiences. Some have been interviewed so many times and were not interested in more interviews, and those same people were, quite frankly, too busy to schedule interviews. There were at least 30 additional people the project sought to interview, including the signees uh, of an appeal for human rights, the statement that I'll talk about here in just a moment. But for various reasons, we're not able to secure those interviews. There are, however, over 40 hours of interviews in the collection, which is accessible online through AtlantaHistoryCenter.com. All of the interviews have been transcribed, edited, and annotated. And so I wanted to play a few excerpts uh, of those interviews that touched upon the strategy, the motivations, and the tactics of the students as they recall their movement. And I wanted to do that through a, a description of the events beginning in February and March of 1960 when those first protests were organized. Uh, there are, of course, much more to these interviews uh, than the accounts of the first several months of the movement of the protests. But in the limited time uh, that I have, I wanted to focus on those today. So the first clip I want to show comes from Lonnie King. Lonnie King was the Morehouse senior, uh, the ex-Navy veteran, the older student who took a took a role in and leading and organizing the students from the six colleges and universities of the Atlanta History Center. So prior to what you're going to hear now, uh, King was talking about his early, prior to what he's saying here, King uh, was talking about his early collaborations and conversations with fellow AUC students. Uh, that would be Julian Bond, Joe Pierce, and Benjamin Brown. They would meet at Yates and Milton's drugstore, which was located on the corner of Auburn Avenue and Butler Street. Uh, and they were joined later by students at Spelman College uh, and other students that they recruited. And they put together a meeting at the Sale Hall Annex uh, at Morehouse on Morehouse's campus. And then all of a sudden, Dr. Benjamin Mays, uh, the president of Morehouse and the other presidents of the schools got wind of what they were doing. And this clip uh, goes into what happened next.
services plan.
Okay, that was a long clip. That was five minutes. I should have told you beforehand. That's the longest clip we're going to have. There's a lot of good information in that clip, a lot of good information that sets up what happens next. So uh, this next clip is from uh, Charles Black. Uh, Charles Black was another Morehouse College student. And in this clip, he very succinctly states what happened uh, after that meeting. He goes a little bit into that meeting, but he states uh, he goes into what happened uh, after as a result. So during the meeting with the Atlanta University Center presidents, uh, they tell the students to write a statement about what they're protesting about. And that statement was, as Charles Black said, the appeal for human rights, uh, which was. Which was written and signed by the student body presidents and then presidents and then published on March 9th, 1960. And it outlined their grievances in a full page ad that was published in the Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta Constitution and the Atlanta Daily World. So this image is very small here and you can't really make it out, make out the text very well, but in it, the students state the ways in which black people were treated by white society. Uh, they chronicled the list of abuses, which included separate and unequal uh, public education facilities in Atlanta uh, and at the university level, uh, the lack of suitable jobs and housing for blacks. They called out the practice of voter intimidation and voter suppression in Georgia and throughout the South. Uh, and they pointed to unequal and inadequate housing for blacks and railed against segregation in movies and concerts uh, and theaters uh, and restaurants. And they blasted police brutality against black people and the lack of black officers in Atlanta. And the students used the appeal to assert their rights as citizens. A direct quote, we do not intend to wait placidly for those rights, which are already legally and morally ours to be meted out to us one at a time. And so what the appeal did, according to the historian Kevin Cruz, is change the tone of the city's race relations and set the agenda for a decade of civil rights protests. And it served as a stirring manifesto for a new generation of black activists. Another quote, we must say in all candor that we plan to use every legal and nonviolent means at our disposal to secure full citizenship rights as members of this great democracy of ours. And so, as you might guess, the appeal drew some angry criticism from local whites. And in this clip, uh, Lonnie King elaborates on that.
So, uh, and as, as Keene correctly states here, Governor Ernest Vanderveer did dismiss the document as, quote, anti-American and called it a left-wing statement that is calculated to breed dissatisfaction, discontent, discord, and evil, and that it carries the same overtones which are usually found in anti-American propaganda pieces. And he was clearly insinuating that communists were inspiring these statements. And this type of red baiting was in the 1950s and 1960s was, of course, very common. So the appeal stunned the white community in Atlanta, which was still adjusting to the widespread desegregation of West Side neighborhoods in Atlanta beginning in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and was still kind of enmeshed in the debate over the desegregation of Atlanta public schools, which would happen about 18 months later. And so even moderates like the Atlanta Constitution editor, Ralph McGill, seemed frustrated and confused by what was happening. He said in response to the appeal um, that uh, I, he said, I feel like a citizen of a medieval walled city who has just gotten word that the plague is coming. Editorialists like Eugene Patterson, who was also at the Atlanta Constitution, a self-described moderate, read the statement and reflected, about it, reflected on it years later and said, I just thought this was communism. So Atlanta's moderates found the pace of racial politics in the 1960s, which they had largely controlled uh, for about a decade, was suddenly slipping from their control. And so now we start to get into the tactics and the strategy of the Atlanta student movement. And in this clip, another Morehouse student, uh, Johnny Parham, elaborates on that. So on March 15th, 1960, nearly 200 Atlanta University Center students requested and were denied service at 10 restaurants and cafeterias. 77 demonstrators were arrested. Many were charged under an anti-trespassing law that had been passed by the Georgia General Assembly the previous month in response to sit-in activities across the South. In connection with the protests, Fulton County officials charged the six signers of the appeal with conspiracy. The students targeted eating establishment and government facilities, transportation centers, and other public spaces, including the federal courthouse, terminal station, and as you can see, Sprayberry's cafeteria on Peachtree Street. The marches, the picketing, and the arrests of students, coupled with opposing demonstration by the Ku Klux Klan, punctured the facade of Atlanta's well-maintained image as the city too busy to hate and affected the merchant's bottom line. So this next clip, again, another Morehouse student, uh, graduate Morris Dillard, uh, gets to the risk that these students faced in going out and protesting, uh, not only to themselves, but to their families.
prison farm. Um, so there were, of course, real world consequences for speaking out uh, and, and protesting injustice in Atlanta in 1960. You could get arrested. Uh, the authorities could send you to prison, uh, which would put the students in potentially threatening and dangerous situations. Now, for the most part, the students were just detained briefly and released, but they did not know that going in, of course. And so when arrested for sitting in at a restaurant uh, where blacks were not served, uh, the police would tell the students that they were trespassing and they gave them a few minutes to leave. And if they did not leave, they would be arrested. And so they forced that dynamic, forced conversations uh, between uh, members of the Atlanta student movement to come to an understanding of who would be willing to be arrested and who would not. And those who did not want to be arrested uh, were essentially given permission by the other students to leave. And those who stayed uh, behind or stayed and were, were jailed were bailed out after their arrest. Uh, and none of these students uh, knew how it was going to work out uh, in practice. Uh, so I do want to uh, share uh, some of the stories of those who were arrested uh, in or just a pr brief profile of some of those who were arrested. In March 1960, uh, Spellman Sr. Herschel Sullivan was uh, selected as co-chair of the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, along with uh, Lonnie King. Uh, she was an Atlanta native uh, and a Merrill Scholar, uh, and she was arrested along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and dozens of other Atlanta University Center students during a demonstration at Rich's department store in October of 1960. Uh, like Sullivan, Lenora Tate was also arrested with Dr. King during demonstrations in October of 1960. And Tate's leadership in the Atlanta student movement, including visiting dormitories uh, with other Spellman seniors to encourage classmates to become involved and, if necessary, to be arrested. Uh, she was also instrumental in planning the logistics of demonstrations. Uh, Brenda Hill was a 16-year-old incoming freshman, and she was warned by her parents not to get involved in the Atlanta sit-ins. Both of her parents were school teachers uh, in public schools, and they feared that they might lose their jobs uh, as a consequence uh, of their daughter's activities by participating in the movement. And despite those warnings, uh, Hill became uh, very involved in, by printing flyers and, and later joining her colleagues uh, on the picket lines. So in this clip uh, from Lydia Douglas of Clark College, she talks about the big target among the, the department stores that the students wanted to, the public to focus on. And that big target was Rich's department store, uh, which like all the major department stores was, was located uh, downtown. So in deciding to focus on the city's downtown department stores, they knew that protests would be highly visible and the problem would be easily understood by both sides, uh, understood by everyone. So they, they quickly became focused on riches 
which was the largest chain in the South. Uh, and it was locally owned and it was therefore very central to the white power structure uh, in Atlanta. And they felt that if riches fell, then they believed that all the other department stores downtown would fall as well. Um, but the students understood that not everyone in the black community uh, would help them. And so after decades of successful negotiations and kind of gentlemen's agreements, uh, in, in, in post-war Atlanta, you know, desegregation of public spaces kind of went like this. Black communities would stage a very cautious challenge to the racial status quo. And then city officials would often wait until they were confronted by court orders to desegregate. And when the, then, at that point, the two parties would very carefully orchestrate out the actual desegre desegregation. Uh, and very little desegregation would actually take place uh, because white people would just pack up and leave. Uh, and they did this in neighborhood and parks and swimming pools and public transportation and then schools. And that whole thing about sort of uh, peacefully cooperating is what gained Atlanta's reputation as the city too busy to hate. But that is not what happened with the Atlanta student movement. They broke this pattern and instead chose very direct confrontation. So, you know, they had these used to have these gentlemen's agreements with with the white counterparts and some in the black establishment would would balk at the thought of sit ins and street protests. Uh, some in the old guard saw the students as outsiders, uh, outsiders, and they worked against them. For example, the editor of the Atlanta Daily World, uh, C.A. Scott kind of represented the public voice of the old guard in the black community. And he refused to really help the students in any way. He published the appeal for human rights, but he charged them the full advertising rate. And from then on, he had editorials that discouraged further protests. Um, and he urged the students to let the older generation just handle things. Uh, and so when they returned with the second advertisement, he didn't run it. Uh, and some of the old guard uh, proposed the uh, opposed the protests uh, against riches specifically because they really believed that the store had uh, deep roots in the community. It had been the first store to offer credit to black customers and the first store to make all the salespeople use titles like Mr. and Mrs. Uh, when addressing uh, black buyers. And so to counter that very real public sentiment about uh, towards riches, the public or the students printed a publication titled uh, the Atlanta Student Movement and You and distributed it to black churches. And in it, they called uh, upon blacks to close out their charge account with riches, um, which were very valuable financial instruments instruments to uh, for black middle class. Um, and it closed them out until riches decided to desegregate. And they appealed to the conscience of black Atlanta. Their mantra was close out your charge account with segregation and open up your account with freedom. And that tactic work, worked and the, the boycott worked. And uh, in September 1961, the eating facilities at riches were desegregated. And that's not really, that's really not the only form of support the students received from uh, Black Atlanta. Many people would commit their homes as collateral to bail the students out of jail. Uh, and these were people not only in Atlanta, but throughout the Southeast. And they put their homes on the line and others signed cash bonds uh, to get the students out of jail. Now, this final clip is from another, is from Morehouse College's Morris Dillard. Uh, and he speaks uh, to the nature of the protest tactics that they used and adopted from Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and the students at Greensboro of, of nonviolent direct action, which uh, underscored their protest against riches.
So over the course of the next three years, uh, participants in the student movement challenged segregation at a number of public buildings and facilities in Atlanta, including public parks and pools at Grady Memorial Hospital and in restaurants and hotels. Uh, participants in the movement supported voter registration and members of the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights helped with other civil rights uh, struggles in Savannah, Savannah, in Moultrie, uh, and in other Georgia cities like Albany. Uh, their efforts combined with other activists and political leaders led to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and desegregated nearly all of Atlanta's public facilities. And the student-led coalition of Atlanta University Center students, uh, black business leaders and clergy, white citizens, that coalition was successful in forcing the hands of Atlanta's white business and political leaders to end the practice of segregation in public facilities. And so doing so, uh, the members of the student movement not only advanced their goal of social equality, but also thrust the city of Atlanta and the South more into the mainstream of American life. The final thing I wanted to talk about are some of the additional archival resources about the Atlanta student movement and where you might find them. They're not just at the Atlanta History Center with this oral history project. For example, the Auburn Avenue Research Library uh, has a collection of oral history interviews that are about the student movement and uh, the civil rights movement in general uh, that were recorded 10 years before, uh, before these interviews were. And the Auburn Avenue Research Library also has the records of the NAACP Atlanta branch. Um, George State University has Lonnie King's papers. Um, and there is also uh, a great oral history project that was done even earlier in the late 1970s by Vincent Fort uh, that served, that, that helped our oral history project uh, quite a bit. Uh, the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff uh, Library has uh, a collection of ephemera from the Atlanta student movement, many of wh which that we use for our exhibition in 2010, uh, including the Mary Ann Smith Wilson and, and Ruby Doris Smith Robinson collection uh, on student activism in general. And Emory University has Lenora Tate's papers. Tate was a Spelman graduate that I showed you an image of, uh, and also Constance Curry, uh, who was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So uh, I just think all these uh, resources that we have document a very important uh, moment, uh, movement in Atlanta's history, uh, one that deserves uh, more study and more observation, and I think is, is inspiring more scholarship. I know uh, the professor at, uh, there's a professor, I believe, who uh, has, has a book coming out in a couple of years uh, on the project, professor at Morehouse, uh, and so I, I anticipate a lot more scholarship of this as we go on. So that's all my presentation today. I hope you enjoyed it.